So, uh, welcome again, and uh, we are very happy to start the uh, forum with the workshop on India. And uh, we are very honored to have four very eminent uh, as, as scholars and uh, uh, writers with us today. And uh, well, for this um, uh, forum, uh, the initial idea was that we would be having a physical face-to-face -face, uh, forum like the previous uh, six forums. And yet, because of the pandemic, so we were holding this and then we were waiting and waiting until it was already the third week of May. And somehow we felt that it's almost impossible to uh, continue to have the, the original idea of um, the physical on-site meeting. So starting from the fourth week of May, we began writing to uh, many of our friends and many of the um, uh, uh, scholars and practitioners and asked if they could join the Zoom uh, webinar. Since we are using Zoom, we try to take advantage of the, um, the, the Zoom webinar, which is that we could all be sitting in our office or in our home and then join the meeting. And we could join from anywhere, from any corner in the world. So that is why uh, we have uh, come up with this program. And uh, you will find that we have uh, for each session of uh, one and a half hours or two hours or three hours, we have many speakers. So uh, it may not be um, uh, so fair to our eminent uh, speakers that uh, they are given only 15 minutes uh, for, to speak. And actually in the main forum, many of them are given only eight minutes to speak. But the whole idea is that uh, we would try to have this as a kind of forum, which would be interactive, and that we would try to bring the bring you together so that there could be a lot of um, interactions and collaborations later on. So this forum is only meant to be one place in which we meet in virtual space, but hopefully we could be doing many things together. And since we've started this forum in this way, we are hoping that maybe uh, later on, every month or every fortnight, we could be having some kind of workshops, seminars. So uh, we look forward uh, to very fruitful uh, discussions and debates. And today, uh, for, the, uh, for this first session of the um, entire forum, we are very honored to have four uh, very eminent uh, speakers with us. So I will introduce uh, uh, them to you uh, as they are starting to speak. So our first speak, uh, the uh, overall um, theme of uh, the today's workshops is uh, to uh, confronting the triple threat, the pandemic, economic downturn, and also the climate crisis in India. Uh, we, uh, the, originally, we were focusing on only the climate change and community regeneration. But because of the pandemic and because of all the uh, ensuing um, militarization, uh, with the uh, downturn in the economy, so we have added the, the question about the global crisis. So we are looking at this uh, triple trap in which the majority of the people, especially the most marginalized, are under a lot of stress and a lot of suffering. So we will be looking at their situation uh, because the mainstream media may not be telling us about uh, them. But then at the same time, we also hope to have um, uh, more uh, hope to try to see uh, where there are already a lot of uh, solidarity uh, work going on, a lot of social movements that try to try to um, fend, uh, uh, take care of themselves instead of um, relying on the authorities. So now we are, uh, would like to start to have our first speaker, Professor Mohanty. He's an old friend of us uh, Chinese friends because he's been here for our forums and he's been uh, also very often been in China and interacting with our friends. So uh, Professor Mohanty, uh, he, you, he's a retired professor from the University of Delhi and uh, he was the founding member and also the former chairperson of the um, Institute of Chinese Studies. And currently, uh, he's working as editor of Social Change, which is published by the Council for Social Development with uh, the SAGE. So uh, we ver uh, welcome Professor Mohanty. So maybe you could speak for about uh, 15 minutes, please. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Kenji. 
uh, you have a great team and i think the south south forum is a very important global democratic transformation initiative we value it a great deal uh, and they connect forces of i call swaraj jefang ubuntu and bnba that is you know self determination self realization liberation mutual interdependence as a principle of uh, existence and uh, nature human integral unity we and we have the latin american concept so i'm so glad to be here in the seventh forum i was i and vidut were personally there in the fifth forum where i spoke on the ubuntu world okay um i think uh, this pandemic has brought out uh, very serious fault lines in uh, in our world and uh, we have to focus on them wherever we are whatever we are talking about uh, and they are visible in india china us europe globally actually uh, and uh, i mean because of paucity of time i will only identify them i think the first fault line is the rising inequalities last few years there has been some talk about them but no policy response to reducing income groups uh, regional disparities all kinds of disparities gender disparities and so on and the second is the decline in publicness you know state commitment community commitment society's commitment to our common problems particularly problems of the marginalized and that came out so clearly during the pandemic you know no public commitment state investment in public infrastructure public health universal health care education etc uh, and the third is a decline of democracy over centralization all over the world uh, in the emergence of demagogic leaders taking advantage of the pandemic crisis and uh, carrying out their personal agenda imposing uh, through what i call disaster mobilization several uh, initiatives we see this in all countries and especially in india now in india the pandemic and i'm talking from delhi where already the uh, the rising curve is very much continuing the last three days that is a slight you know stagnation or even decline in the total number but it has crossed 100000 uh, in delhi and in india more than 700000 uh, uh, close to 8 800000 uh, in india 20000 plus deaths already and so on the only silver lining is because of the large country and the uh, and uh, some uh, factors uh, other structural factors uh, the death rate is <coughs> uh low somewhat at the moment but we have not seen the peak yet so uh and it is the third largest uh in terms of uh, the pandemic uh, infections now um you know the lockdown which was imposed on the 24th of march with four hour notice created havoc for the poor particularly for labor particularly for migrant labor and uh today i think the first thing we have to remember and this has been not only in india you know the unorganized uh, sector workers in china in us in europe everywhere and now we are seeing it in brazil uh, uh, everywhere they have been the worst affected and in india this is most evident and today the crisis in india is as much the health crisis as the labor crisis particularly migrant labor crisis and at least 140 million migrant labor were affected and if they have a family of four or five you can imagine 500 600 million people uh, almost half the indian population has been suffering under the pandemic because of the, the lockdown the way it was implemented and it has caused more serious crisis so it has created livelihood hazards Uh, and that is my second point the livelihood crisis is evident in so many ways already there was an economic downturn before the uh, pandemic 
And that has been accentuated. There is going to be a negative growth rate, uh, at least minus two, but it may be more. Minus two percent, it may be more. But the hunger, starvation cases have increased so badly. And we see, uh, you know, in, in, uh, well, there, there is an estimate that at least 200 people have died on hunger and starvation. At least 700 people have died en route to home, you know, from their places of work, from cities. Uh, and, you know, uh, the statistical system, as far as labor is concerned, and particularly migrant labor, is very fragile, very weak, very unreliable. Uh, and therefore, uh, and you know, labor is neglected. It is, it is an invisible uh, factor in the neoliberal, in the capitalist era as a whole and neoliberal capitalist era particularly. Now, <clears throat> three months later came the package. And what kind of package for migrant labor? A uh, kind of a subsistence support for 125 days package just before, uh, uh, I mean, uh, because the Bihar elections are coming up in October. Uh, so Bihar and UP, they were the you know, targets of propaganda. And we have been demanding, all the economists and democratic parties, opposition have been demanding direct support, mobile ration card all over the country. And no card should be needed for giving ration, an adequate ration that has not been granted. Manrega, there has been an, an increase, but the increase even of 40,000 crore is still very marginal. And most of the people who went back, they're skilled laborers. They can't work. They, they are not uh, prepared to work on Narega uh, kind of construction work, earth work, and so on. And so they are use the unemployment. Unemployment, destitution, livelihood crisis is the major, major effect. This is a structural characteristic of economies like India suffering from neoliberal growth. But that has come to the open in most uh, significant way. But the third dimension, the political dimension, is equally disturbing. The authoritarian impetus. I mean, you know, we have we already had so many authoritarian measures. Kashmir, uh, uh, you know, autonomy was uh, snatched away in. Uh, August, 5th of August, constitutional amendment, so-called, without consulting, according to the constitutional provision, the people of Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, and turning the state into a union territory, two union territories, uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. Then came the Triple Talaq, then the CAA, Citizenship Amendment Act, which is an anti-Muslim uh, legislation, which completely overturned the foundational values in the preamble of Indian constitution. And then on this issue, the whole country had seen many, many demonstrations. And that is when the Delhi riots were engineered by, by the uh, RSS and BJP uh, activists against the Muslims. Uh, and then came the pandemic. So already the authoritarian communal uh, wave was going on. Hindu nationalist wave, and I don't have time to talk about the lynching and all that uh, of Muslims and Dalits that was taking place already before. Uh, and therefore, pandemic has actually accentuated this authoritarian politics. And you have the prime minister addressing the nation and asking everybody to follow and taking advantage of this crisis so many labor rights were restricted. UP, Madhya Pradesh, the BJP states, many of them, they have now liberalized labor laws and abolished many of the safeguards which were existing in uh, legislations. And uh, many, many anti-labor and also anti-environmental uh, initiatives have been done. You know, the new uh, environment impact assessment draft rules are anti-environment totally 
and I don't have time to talk about the, the climate crisis evident in what happens to Delhi in November every year. What, happened, what is happening in cyclones, the frequency of cyclones, the Kerala floods, the Odisha cyclones, the Bengal cyclone, uh, and how India has been suffering from continuous effects of global warming. And this regime, all regimes have been very uh, hostile to serious environmental measures, but this one is particularly. Today's report in the newspaper front page is 178 highway projects have to be have been cleared, given forest clearance, for example, just to give you one example. Then uh, I think uh, the uh, and in this situation, the uh, the authoritarian policy and you know the carving of civil liberties, police has police has uh, often played a helpful role in help, you know serving with food, water, and so on. But it has also taken advantage of this situation to be aggressively hostile to, to minorities and many others. Uh, and arbitrary arrests have taken place. The latest being the Tamil Nadu case of Jairaj and his son, uh, Benis. Uh, and uh, fortunately, because of the uh, civil liberty groups uh, staring, uh, the police have been arrested uh, last week. Uh, and there have, and the Bhima Koregao case is one of the greatest attacks on civil liberty movement in this country. And one of the accused, Gautam Dablekha, uh, instead of getting bail for health reasons or COVID reasons, uh, or the Vivir Varavar Rao and others, so many of them, uh, 12 plus, uh, who are in Pune jail, uh, they have been denied bail. Uh, and they are not being given uh, the proper uh, health support in the jail. So the attack on civil liberties is uh, escalated during this period. Now I will use the last few minutes to talk about what is likely to happen uh, as we uh, go, go further. Uh, I don't say post-COVID world, but uh, at least in this dark situation what we are seeing first i think we are seeing that we, we are seeing that the grassroots movements are very active because the actual implementation of some pro people services were done by the panchayats by the local governments by the ngos by the grassroots groups and therefore uh, we have to demonstrate the value of decentralized pro Soraj forces. How, you know, panchayats, the local governments have been very, very active in saving lives. Uh, so that is one. And people saw that in reality, not the big leaders talking from, uh, you know, capitals on, on television. Number two, labor has emerged as the most visible category, particularly the migrant labor. And they, they resorted to what the press reported as riots, demonstrations in Surat, in Delhi, in Chennai, in uh, Mumbai, uh, Bandra railway station, in Bangalore, and so on. The unrest because their livelihood rights, their fundamental rights were violated. Uh, and therefore, employment has become a very major issue not just subsistence support for three months, extended by another three months. No, structural transformation to give full employment. Third, this inequalities issue, gender and caste issues, and the, uh, for example, the domestic violence, I'm sure uh, the other side, particularly the is going to talk about it. Uh, I will not uh, uh, extend that point. So the, uh, the domestic violence, uh, the particular hardships that women and women labor and women in general faced, and the discrimination even in quarantine centers of minorities, that is Muslims, of Dalits, uh, of Adivasis in some places, uh, that took place. And how Adivasi areas, which got back some of the uh, uh, migrant labor, they, they don't know what to do. Uh, 
because the um, the uh, uneven development in india is so stark that they are not able to provide uh, employment in those areas and finally lack of public investment has become an issue and the privatization wave which had become so dominant uh, is going to be challenged therefore the post covid in fact right now these issues and this should be part of the agenda of the sss globally that we have to highlight the rising inequalities issues what we should do about it highlight how important is democracy and civil liberties and decentralized participatory democracy and how important is sustainability as a value therefore covid crisis gives us a big challenge and some opportunities some hope thank you uh, thank you very much uh, professor mohanty so uh, we will come back later to more discussions about some of the, the issues you raised now we would like to invite uh, professor An anuradha chenoy uh, to speak uh, professor chenoy is um, Dean of, of the School of International Studies of Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. So she has been the Chairperson and Area Studies Director in the Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies said uh, earlier. She has met, written many books, monographs and articles and you could go onto the Global University website to look at her works. She has also been short, uh, done short-term uh, consultancies with the International Committee of the Red Cross, with UNESCO, Action Aid International, UN Women, and UN Peacekeepers. So, uh, Professor Chen Noi, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Kinchi and SSF. I'm delighted to be here and delighted with the panel, who are all friends. And uh, in a sense, uh, Professor Mohanty has given a broad overview, and uh, I completely agree with him. Uh, so some of my points would might be rep repetitive, but I will flesh out what uh, he argued uh, because our argument is very similar. Now, um, I think that this uh, triple trap in India is actually a crisis uh, to the power of N uh, because it's not just on an economic uh, downturn and a climate crisis, but it's also a crisis of governance of the fragility of uh, democracy itself and the surfacing of a deep national security state which has risen to the top and uh, so india um, the indian state like the 40 other majoritarian illiberal democracies uh, with right wing populist leadership has used uh, the pandemic as an opportunity to amplify uh, a medical crisis as an emergency in order to increase their control over citizens and expand their influence in both domestic, regional, and international spheres. So this crisis really, what you call the triple tra uh, trap, uh, it can also be called a humanitarian or a systemic crisis with uh, coincides with the dual impact of uh, neoliberal capitalism and a militarized uh, globalism. Uh, of course, as Manu also said, it is uneven, but it's also combined in its impact as it seeps into governance, into institutions, into society, and in fact, into individual uh, lives. And you can see uh, the intersectionality of this uh, very, very clearly. Uh, and I'll now explain this with reference uh, to uh, India. Now, uh, given India's uh, inability to resolve the colonial border issues, especially with Pakistan and China, and in order to gloss over the internal discriminations based on caste, class, and gender, there has been a gradual shift from a negotiated nationalism to one which is territorial, which is xenophobic, and uh, that can support and entrench a post-colonial regressive elite. In a system which so far in the last 70 years or so, 
um, where there have been white liberal voices questioning uh, legitimate opposition, multiple conversations, embedded rights, despite that fact that there were deep aberrations, uh, then there were social and people's movement, organic intellectuals, etc. Uh, who can see uh, from Manu and Urvashi and others. But despite this, and there were liberation, you know, movements which were not fully successful and a long way to go, yet these have caused such anxiety to the regime that they believe to change this hegemony, to achieve hegemony, they require both the use of force, the use of the prison complex, and a privileging of muscular religious, one religion, nationalism, and this kind of a religious supremacy. Further, I, I believe that the enemy construction abroad and on the borders has now clearly been reconstructed to link with the enemy within. So with all uh, the oppressions, uh, the enemy is seen more within, uh, even while uh, it's expressed as the enemy uh, abroad. Uh, now, so there is therefore a heightened increase of militarist values in civilian life. Uh, and you see this intervention all the time. And this, has in, this was there earlier, but it has increased manifold with uh, the coming uh, to power of uh, the Bharatiya Janta Party, whose core and its cadre rest on a militant privileging uh, of uh, uh, majoritarian uh, upper caste, uh, Hindu nationalism, uh, Islamophobia, uh, etc. Now, and despite you know, this whole um, increase uh, in uh, the GDP and India as an emerging power, that kind of narrative, uh, this has coincided with the deep inequalities, um, with uh, uh, low investments in social sector, especially in education and health. And in this conjuncture, an anxiety, especially in the broadened middle class, uh, enabled the victory of a Hindu majoritarian leader whose <coughs> credentials of uh, muscular Hindu nationalism and presiding over mob violence against um, minorities as chief minister uh, is internationally known. Now I will use, um, you know, uh, this Turkish uh, intellectual East uh, Temel Kural's uh, explanation on knowing um, populism, uh, where uh, she uh, actually says it's the act of politicizing and mobilizing ignorance to the point of political and moral insanity. But a lot of readings on populism, I think they uh, lead out this eliding of the external with the internal militarism and uh, how it influences the, the external influences the domestic. Um, so, uh, and we get on to how these national security states now are being re reconstructed uh, and constitutions are being uh, overturned and India and even the Philippines are prime examples besides Brazil, Egypt, Turkey, etc. But I will focus on India. Now, of course, um, uh, in while this national security state especially came out uh, with uh, earlier Pokhran and others, but uh, in the pandemic, you could see that both the prime minister and the home minister, the two leading political figures, they continuously referred to the pandemic as a war. Uh, with them saying that we will win both wars, one the COVID and the other on the uh, uh, at the border, the uh, line of actual control. And the quotation was, we will win these war. Uh, the health officials are, they didn't never refer to them as health officials or health workers, but as warriors. Now what this did was, and what it's doing, because it continues this discourse. One, it diverts the attention from the lack of health facilities, to the idea of threat and enemy. Uh, and the enemy, in the, in the, even in the initial days of uh, the COVID, was blamed on an Islamic congregation. So COVID is, was identified with the minority community, and they were stigmatized as a consequence. Second, it just justifies the use of emergency and exceptional methods, which have been used 
uh, in this kind of horrific lockdown which we had, uh, in which it then they justified the sacrifices which the workers, the urban, the migrant workers, the uh, uh, the peasantry had to face, uh, and followed with this obedience to the leader. Fourth, it was justified uh, the, this emergency for dr draconian legislation and to curb citizens' rights. Uh, it took away the dignity of care workers and militarized the uh, medical professionals and those who died as sacrifice, collateral damage, honoring citizens as, uh, you know, and over 106 doctors, for example, have already died. Uh, and we're still not at the peak. So my next point really is then, so what did this Indian regime do during COVID? Uh, in the economy, and I'll, I'll be very brief, uh, uh, first, I think, I think Manu already showed that how uh, the lockdown was so quick that it, um, uh, you know, it, uh, it was actually a crackdown uh, or it was a lockout. They locked out the working people from their livelihoods, from their places of work uh, and li living, which they no longer could afford. And there was this long walk home by almost... Um, six or seven million uh, workers. Second, they stepped up privatization. Even while announcing a COVID-19 relief package, the prime minister removed the key public sector industries out of the strategic sector, opening the private privatization of sectors like railway, coal, insurance, oil, energy, and especially Indian railways, where just uh, a week ago, they announced privatization of uh, players into uh, running almost to 109 destinations. Second, they diluted the hard won labor laws in favor of corporates. You can see that, uh, and I'll give a reference when this paper is, is put up. A hundred years work of the trade union has gone backwards. Um, third, they monetized land. They made it much easier for land to be alienated and transferred it from the small farmer to the corporates and for mining. Fourth, they've shifted to something called self-reliance. Uh, but there seems to be no clear plan on this because foreign development, uh, direct investment is welcome. But at the same time, there, this um, self-reliance is very targeted only towards uh, enemies. And, um, you know, so uh, there will be self-reliance outside, for example, the Chinese or, or Pakistani or other kind of investment, but not against uh, American uh, or uh, European investment. So it's very lopsided. And then, of course, the defense budgets continue to uh, uh, increase. And so now defense accounts for 11% uh, of India's overall uh, expenditures, whereas health, uh, for example, accounts for only 2%. Uh, and while there are some so-called packages, these are basically assistance and uh, aid packages. Now about environment, there have been two or three horrifying uh, steps during COVID. One is that the government notified the draft environmental uh, impact assessment in which all future projects sideline the precautionary measurements and the principles. And there are very few fines for any violations, which were much harsher earlier. So prior to today, uh, environmental clearance was given to 191 projects. Uh, you know, especially on coal, to the extent that even uh, the UN Secretary General uh, Guterres said that what does coal have, he said it obliquely, but he said, what does coal have to do with the COVID relief package? Because 41 coal mines were given clearance and some of them in sanctuaries, oil sanctuary uh, and oil uh, um, excavation mining um, was given in Assam which goes across an elephant corridor. A, a wall was broken uh, and activists have really, really been um, 
yelling about it, but they're given very little space in our totally controlled uh, crony uh, media, uh, which uh, is often referred to in the alternate as the lapdog uh, media, really. Uh, so these 41 coal auction of 41 coal uh, blocks uh, was initiated. Um, and all activists who have analyzed these uh, drafts say that uh, there will be an undeterred and resulting massive rise in CHG emissions and other air pollutants. And these draft environmental laws will very negatively impact fish of oak folk, the indigenous communities, uh, etc. Then on national, the national security, all this is building up to the national security state. These are aspects of it. The fact that uh, the um, uh, activists and environmentalists and the affected community were not even given an opportunity to protest because all protest is almost bank, uh, banned. And um, it is, uh, as one of our uh, justices said, uh, and our very famous legal uh, luminary said that it is not freedom of speech actually, but freedom after speech. So there's a clamp down on our freedom after speech. After you, uh, after you speak, you will then have these first information reports and, uh, and all kinds of harassment, uh, different types of uh, multiple types of harassment, uh, which I think some of my uh, co-panelists here might have also uh, faced. Then as far as defense and the borders and militarism, direct militarism is concerned, you could see recently uh, the confrontation on the Sino-Indian uh, border, uh, the removal of Article 370 from Kashmir, which Manu already referred to. Uh, and in all this, uh, the army chief is the one who's saying we should be self-reliant. Now, what does he have to do with economics? It's the first time that the army chief has actually intervened in making a statement on the economy in India, which is very different to Pakistan, Egypt, Turkey, etc. So you can see how militarism is gradually but surely uh, creeping in. And with this excuse, uh, you know, the, the, there has been such a crackdown on uh, civil rights activists, on human rights defenders, especially very hard on intellectuals, on students, on, on uh, academics, uh, and young idealist students, uh, young women students, and I think Urvashi will talk about uh, the Pinjara Thor, th this group particularly, uh, so I won't deal into it, but these are two of my own students who are now in jail under the most draconian legislation just for having uh, expressed the right for freedom and for breaking down walls, opening windows, uh, opening barriers, uh, etc. So uh, lastly, the impact of COVID has been obviously felt very unequally. And those who are already unequal have felt it even more. That is uh, uh, Muslim, all informal workers, but especially Muslim informal workers who, who are about 50% in urban areas uh, who've been stigmatized and have not had any wages. Uh, on women, on children who, because schools are closed, who've not been able to avail of the midday scheme. Uh, and uh, the reality is that with these uh, reforms, the suppression of uh, dissent uh, is there to facilitate capital and uh, power. Um, uh, and I think my last uh, one and a half points is, I think I'd like to quote my colleague and friend, Professor Amit Bahadri, who said that uh, the role of the state needs to be neutral, which should act fair like an umpire between capital and labor, between uh, power and dissent. But in India, this neutrality uh, has totally been lost and the state is totally on the side of uh, capital, on the side of uh, oppression, on the side of uh, 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 the military rights, uh, uh, etc. And lastly, my last point is the resistance, the resistance which is still coming from civil society, 
from uh, sections of the academia, even while some have gone along, as, as in every state, with the regime, even from sections of the judiciary. Uh, but sadly, the opposition remains weak and fragmented and uneven. Uh, but uh, the, I think people are watching. And uh, even while there is this dark side of the pandemic, there is that glimmer of hope in the background. Uh, and I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Chen Noi. So um, uh, now we would like to invite uh, Professor Arindam Banerjee uh, from the Ambedkar University of Delhi. Uh, so Professor Banerjee has also been in Hong Kong and uh, we have had very interesting discussions. He's also participated uh, in the uh, uh, well, in a survey of uh, uh, seven emerging countries uh, that we've been uh, doing uh, uh, since uh, 2011. So Professor Banerjee, uh, he's currently teaching economics in the Ambedkar University in Delhi. And he has come, he, his doctoral thesis was on peasant classes in the context of an agrarian crisis in India. And his research uh, interests are in agrarian relations, hunger and poverty, colonialism and development of uh, capitalism. So now, uh, yeah, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Kinchi, uh, for inviting me to present my views uh, in this very interesting uh, uh, forum that uh, you are organizing uh, at a very crucial time as well. Uh, I'll kind of largely focus on uh, what has happened to the uh, Indian economy. Uh, in the midst of this uh, pandemic, uh, I, we, we need to note that uh, as far as the Indian economy is concerned, a slowdown was already there in the pre-COVID period. Uh, the Indian economy for the last financial year, uh, the GDP growth was uh, around 4.2%, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which is much lower uh, than the, uh, than growth rates that has been experienced over the let's say in the last one and a half decades. Largely, one can identify uh, three different uh, processes, uh, longer processes, uh, which had led to this economic slowdown even before the pandemic uh, hit the uh, hit uh, hit the world. Uh, one, uh, there was a significant crisis in the banking sector. Uh, particularly with the uh, higher uh, levels of non-performing assets, uh, non-repayment of loans, uh, largely by the business houses. Uh, this was uh, exacerbated by the non-banking financial corporations uh, crisis where toxic assets emerged with certain financial scams. And this was leading to a certain trust deficit in the economy already investments not happening at the rate as one would uh, uh, desire. The other two processes are much more longer term processes which have led to this uh, economic slowdown. One is the long process uh, that we have witnessed in the neoliberal era, the era of neoliberal reforms of labor cheapening, uh, particularly something which is uh, indicated by uh, the decline in the wage share, a significant decline in the wage share to the extent that today in the manufacturing sector in India, out of every hundred rupees of value added, that is added, the value added that is generated, only around 1.8 rupees, 1.8 rupees go to labor. The third process is about the agrarian crisis, where a large section of the farmers, particularly small and medium farmers, uh, have been uh, small, marginal and medium farmers, which constitute around more than 80% of the farming community, have been witnessing a decline in farm incomes due to a multiplicity of reasons, including the fact that they have been subjected to rising indebtedness with repeated price crashes, intermittent price crashes of agricultural products. 
and the condition of agricultural labor consequently whose wages have also not increased for a very long period of time except for a gap of or a period small period of 4 to 5 years after the national rural employment guarantee act was introduced uh, uh, there was some wage adjustment real wages increased but real wages have again been declining for the last uh, say at least from 2013 onwards or they are stagnant now these two processes the cheapening of labor and the agrarian crisis has led to a significant problem of agrarian aggregate demand in the economy is not enough demand for mass consumption goods industries uh, are facing uh, unutilized capacities uh, you even have uh, uh, news coming of uh, uh, i mean the biscuit companies uh, not being able to sell their products and running at under their, their capacities now even before the pandemic hit uh, the response from from the government as far as the economic uh, uh, downturn is concerned uh, was largely inadequate primarily because uh, it was not recognizing the major reasons for the slowdown itself that is the demand deficit the major step that the government undertook uh, was to uh, undertake a uh, or implement a drastic cut in the corporate tax rates and instead of reviving investments what that has led to is a significant decline in the tax collections of the government as per the last budget that was presented of the total tax target for the last financial year till the at the end of 9 months that is by december 2019 only around 56% of the tax had been collected and of course the latest figure shows that tax collections have been have have, have been a, a significantly less than what the targets were so this is the economic situation with reduced capacity of the government reduced economic growth uh, historically high unemployment rates that uh, india kind of entered the uh, phase of the pandemic now of course uh, my co panelists have already spoken about some of the major impacts uh, as far as the economic uh, is concerned uh, in terms of the migrants crisis the reverse migration from the urban centers uh, to the rural areas from other rural areas which were uh, hot spots for jobs uh, to to back to their villages uh, there has been a significant deepening of the agrarian crisis as per the different predictions uh, in terms of what has happened to the indian economy as far as the first quarter of 2020 21 is concerned that is this financial year in the first quarter uh, according to the estimates by the state bank of india roughly around 40% of the economy has contracted and this is for the first quarter from april to june uh, goldman sachs estimates it at 45% so there has been a 45% 40 to 45% contraction as far as the predictions for the entire year is concerned largely the predictions are of a negative growth rate or a contraction of the gdp anywhere between 4 to 5% according to different estimates made by fitch adb uh, imf etc etc however much of these estimates might actually not be capturing the real change that is happening in the indian economy this is so because uh, in the event of the sudden lockdown as has been kind of explained by uh, professor mohanty and professor chinoy uh, the sudden lockdown was a brutal assault on the informal economy where 90% plus workers of the in, of in india are located and what is happening is there is a significant wiping out of sections of the informal economy informal businesses petty uh, producers and those are being supplanted or replaced by the formal economy now typically the way gdp is measured uh, much of the informal economy is measured by taking indicators from formal economy with the assumption that there is a there is a uh, synchronization between the formal and the economy, informal economy the formal economy growing it is dependent on the informal economy and therefore the informal economy must also be growing 
Now, in such a situation where the informal economy is being destroyed and supplanted by more formal economic activities, those indicators are definitely not going to give us the true picture of the extent of the economic contraction. And according to the to an estimate uh, made by the ex-chief statistician of India, Dr. Pranab Sen, the contraction over the over this financial year can be anywhere around 16 to 17 percent, and that is going to be a severe outcome uh, as far as the Indian economy is concerned. In terms of the reverse migration, if you just look at some of the figures, as far as the declaration of the government goes, uh, this was declared by uh, the Solicitor General before the Supreme Court, uh, which said that uh, there was a reverse migration of uh, around 9.7 million migrant workers. And this is a gross underestimate because this is only looking at the migrant workers who were uh, who were facilitated to return uh, through the special uh, labor tra trains. But this is something that's happening only in the month of May. For one and a half months from middle of March to April, there was a complete paralysis of public transport and people were actually walking back. The heart-wrenching scenes of uh, people carrying their children on their, uh, uh, on their uh, shoulders, walking back thousands of miles. Uh, people also kind of uh, pregnant women walking, delivering uh, uh, their uh, babies on the road and then walking back to home. And of course, as already mentioned, there was a significant number of people who actually died on the streets. For a long period of time, the migrant workers were invisibilized by the Indian state, uh, by the government. There was a complete non-recognition uh, of the crisis. Uh, eventually, I mean, when you try to, when you look back at the crisis and try to estimate, you realize that even before the migrant crisis started, there was a significant number of migrant workers who had returned to their villages for the celebration of the festival of Holi, which was in early March, it's the festival of colors. And an estimated 5 million such workers never returned back to the cities because it's from the middle of the of March, it was very clear that we were heading towards a medical crisis and an and a imminent lockdown. There aren't exact data of how many people walked on foot, but according to certain estimates made by scholars uh, who work on migration, uh, the figure could be anywhere between uh, 10 to 20 million. So taking into account the people who returned by the uh, by the labor trains, the people who had already come back and were unable to go back to their work sites in the urban areas, and those who walked uh, back home, uh, walked back thousands of miles uh, on foot. Taking all of that, one can say that even a conservative estimate would tell us that between the months of April to June, uh, anywhere between 25 to 30 million migrant workers returned back to their villages. Now, what is the implication of this? This is already 8 to 10% of the rural workforce. The existing, the pre-existing rural workforce, there has been an addition of 8 to 10% only in these three months. Now, assuming that the COVID curve peaks somewhere over the next three months, we are nowhere near the peak. peak. Uh, every, I mean, Delhi and Bombay are currently uh, I mean, Maharashtra and Delhi are currently kind of uh, uh, facing very high number of infections, but it's also rising in other places. So one can safely assume that India is not going to reach the peak anywhere before three months, which essentially means that any hope of economic recovery, and much of this economic recovery now depends on uh, the mitigation of the fear that is there in urban areas across the economy, of, of catching the infection and not getting adequate health care and, and succumbing to the infection. So workers are not going to return to the cities in large numbers, to the numbers in the order of which they have gone back to the villages as long as the scare of the virus is there. In fact, they are more vulnerable. The poor working people are more vulnerable to the virus given the woefully inadequate public health care that we have. And if you look at some of the 
rates at which private hospitals were charging till of course the government recently trying to regulate them but there is great difficulty in terms of getting admission into private hospitals there is a lot of money making and, uh, and and profit making that is happening so in such a situation one can expect that there would be a further movement of people back to the villages and even at a slower rate one can i mean this is again a prediction it's a complex situation emerging but it can lead to a situation where we see that by the end of the year around 50 to 60 million people have migrated back to their villages now that is around 20 percent addition to the rural workforce we are already seeing the effect of that in the month of may there was an increase in the demand for the national guarantee employment guarantee work uh, this is not the demand this is actually uh, the the additional work that was uh, uh, jobs that were given as far as the nrg is concerned to the order of 10.5 million so 10.5 million people uh, 10.5 million more people working in the nrg in in may compared to the uh, month of may last year. so that's the kind of uh, crisis that has happened according to the latest cmi data uh, unemployment have unemployment has come down they had estimated that nearly 122 million people had lost jobs in april and may uh, some of that a large part of that apparently have come back to employment in the month of june uh, something uh, that they have uh, kind of published uh, just today morning however they give a word of caution that much of this restoration of employment is at a much lower levels of incomes either in nrga jobs or in factories where you are getting paid for 15 days because the factory is not functioning for 30 days or you are overcrowding agriculture there's a massive increase in underemployment in the economy one can safely assume that around anywhere between 900 million to 1 billion people of the total population of 1.3 billion 38 billion people currently in india around 900 to 1 billion people have experienced a significant income loss <clears throat> In terms of the agricultural sector, which has not been, the rural areas have not been directly hit by the virus yet. But that does not mean that the agricultural, the rural economy is insulated from this crisis. And this is primarily because there has been a disappearance of a significant part of the private commercial demand for agricultural products. Restaurants, canteens, Different kinds of food product shops, sweet shops uh, are all closed or they're functioning with much reduced demand. And therefore, the demand, the private demand, private economic demand for agricultural commodities have reduced. In fact, a good indicator of this is that in the middle of the pandemic, where the government procurement was functioning, the government procurement for wheat was functioning with a lot of glitches. There has been a procurement as per the latest data, the final data is not yet out, but as per the latest data, 38.8 million tons of wheat has been procured by the government. Farmers have sold their wheat to the government to that order. And that is around 20% more than the 32 million tons of wheat procurement that the government did in the previous year. Perhaps that figure, the final figure might actually cross 40 million tons when the July 1st figures come. Now, I'd like to spend the last few minutes on what has been the response from the government as far as the economy is concerned. Well, the most important response that they have given uh, is a moratorium on loans, which means that for three months you need not pay, your, uh, pay back your loans, your EMIs, uh, for businesses, for individuals. And uh, they have extended that further, the moratorium. And this is primarily gone to save the financial system, the banking system in the country. With already high levels of NPAs, the banking system and the financial system could not afford any further deterioration in their balance sheets. And unless this moratorium would have been, would, was announced, very large part of the bank's assets would have turned back. 
this alone uh, constituted to a relief package of, as the government is claiming, to the order of around 800,000 uh, uh, crores of, of rupees. The important point to note here is, of course, that the interest on these loans are accumulating, which means that it is eventually on the borrowers that the cost of this relief would, would be helped. The second uh, kind of response uh, is the abolition of labor laws, dilution of labor laws across many state governments, particularly those ruled by the, by the uh, ruling uh, uh, party at the central government, the Bharatiya Janata Party. And this is with the hope that a lot of investments from China and uh, from other parts, American companies are going to come into India uh, and take advantage of cheap labor. Except when you understand that only 1.8% of the value added is going to labor already in the manufacturing sector. There is not much scope for deriving any advantage from cheapening labor further. But that, of course, is not in the recognition of the policy makers. The third set of responses is in the agricultural sector, where regulations on uh, the government, the agricultural markets, which were implemented through the Agricultural Producing Marketing Companies Act, the APMC Act, has been diluted or abolished, uh, again led by some of the BJP ruled states. And there is an attempt to facilitate contract farming with big companies. And there has been the abolition of the Essential Commodities Act, which used to put a cap on hoarding by private traders. And all the Essential Commodities Act has also been uh, repealed. Now, all of this is apparently for giving better price to farmers. Uh, but in the name of these big farmers, essentially, uh, it's big corporate capital which is being invited into agricultural sector. Capital actually is trying to move into the rural economy, given that the urban economy is completely uh, stalled and recovering only limping back to normalcy now. This is indicated by the recent uh, tie-up between the Reliance uh, companies, Geo uh, mobile networks, and Facebook, and they're now attempting to buy out, buy out the biggest uh, uh, retail uh, network in the country, and uh, the ultimate aim is to sell vegetables in the cities. The abolishing the Essential Commodities Act in the middle of this pandemic is a sure recipe for intensifying hunger and famine, particularly when the current announcement of the free rations end in November. The government has refused to universalize the PDS. It has refused the demand of the, uh, of the progressive uh, activists, uh, the social uh, organizations, to allocate a larger amount of uh, food grains uh, as, as, as part of the ration system without uh, introducing or avoiding the technological difficulties of biometric matching. Uh, there were suggestions of distributing rations to everybody who wants it using the indelible link, something which the government has not agreed to. The irony of the situation is that with the large volumes of wheat procurement, the government, uh, the Food Corporation of India currently holds stocks of around 97 million tons of food grains and over the last three months it has distributed anywhere between 19 million uh, anywhere around 18 to 19 million stocks of food grains of which one must remember that as per the national food security act the government would have anyway distributed somewhere around 15 to 16 million tons of food grains in the uh, in in three months so it has only additionally distributed uh, around three and a half to four million tons of food grains. Now this is a clear reluctance to recognize the, the, the widespread situation of income losses and income deflation that large sections of the population have undergone. Final point uh, in terms of how one looks at these uh, responses from the government, particularly, again, there has been some 
increase in the allocation for the NRG work, some 40,000 crores, as Professor Mohanty was mentioning. But that, again, uh, would address anywhere around only 20% of the new job demand that has emerged in the rural areas. There is a de demand for Urban Employment Guarantee Act, which the government is not paying heed to. In a sense, it seems that the apathy that the government and the ruling establishment, the bureaucracy has shown to the migrant workers, to the small marginal medium farmers, to the laborers, in terms of abolishing the labor laws, taking away their hard earned rights. It seems the capitalist class, the business class in India is not interested in preserving a reserve army of lab labor for better times, rather, uh, petty producers and uh, the precarious casual labor are looked at as surplus unwanted labor in the Indian economy and it, therefore in the Indian society. This is primarily the reason why there has been a significant reduction of democratic rights and democratic voices for people particularly incarcerated, those who are fighting for informal labor and, and, and for uh, and and for the for the marginal farmers, it seems that the capitalist system in India today does not need this population, and they can go into a much higher uh, levels of labor productivity. That is the reason why there has been this brutal and ruthless destruction of the informal labor. I think I'll stop there, and we can discuss other concerns over the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arin Dab. Thank you. So Arindam has uh, focused on the plight of the migrant workers and uh, especially on the rural, in the rural scene. And now we would like to invite uh, Uvashi Batalia uh, to talk about, uh, uh, to focus on the question of women and gender. So I think uh, our Chinese uh, uh, audience uh, are also very familiar with uh, Uvashi Batalia's work, The Other Side of Silence, because that was translated into Chinese uh, uh, I think many years ago, almost 20 years ago. So Uvashi is the first uh, feminist publisher in India and she's the co-founder of Kali for Women and now the director of Suban. So, and um, she has, she is a very dear friend and she has been in Hong Kong many times and we hope we can still welcome you uh, here again. So now please, uh, Uvashi. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kinchi, and thank you all for inviting me, and thank you to your team for organizing this amazing uh, conference spread over many days. So as you said, I'm going to focus on women specifically, and I will jump straight into it in the interest of time. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Kinchi mentioned my book uh, translated into Chinese. The Chinese translation was the very first translation, and it was Kinchi and her group of students who got together and not only translated it, but also had it published. So many thanks for that. So um, the speakers before me have actually pointed to a lot of things and laid the context. Uh, so I, what I want to start with is a story. In India, when the first phase of the lockdown began, a group of women activists wrote a detailed letter to the chief minister of Delhi. They advised him of their concerns about how women would fare during the pandemic and the lockdown. They suggested what the state needed to do to ensure that women's rights were not abrogated and asked that the state take note of the experiences of women in previous disasters and draw on those to put in place a policy and a budget and on the basis of those to take action. And they recommended a number of very specific actions. While the immediate context of the letter was the pandemic, there was another key reason that dictated it, and the previous speakers have all pointed to that. The pandemic and lockdown put an end to a series of unique protests, again, on, against the new citizenship law, which the government had brought in, and these protests had taken place across the country. And everywhere, consistently, women had been in the lead of the protests, and what was at stake was their rights as citizens of India. So similarly, once the pandemic hit, there was a very strong fear that the hard fought gains of the women's movement would be lost. And this did in fact happen, as I will describe in a minute. Predictably, of course, the state took no notice of the women's letter, but everything the women had pointed to actually happened. 
Levels of domestic violence went up exponentially as women and men and children remain locked in small homes 24 seven because all response services such as helplines, counseling, police action were suspended in order to deal with the medical emergency. Women had nowhere to go to complain. Before the lockdown, even if response services did not work, some relief was available in being able to share your pain with other women in the community. But now the community had all but been destroyed and there was no public sphere where communities could thrive. So women had no friends or neighbors to whom they could talk. As well, women in India are said to have only 38% of those who own cell phones are women and women often do not have independent access. So even if they wanted to report, even if services had been somewhere available, how would they have done this? Who would they have talked to? Sexual and reproductive health services were more or less suspended and even pregnant women had to run from pillar to post for the simple act of giving birth. A women's group called Sama was forced to file a petition in the courts for pregnant women to be allowed to use ambulances to get to hospitals to be able to give birth. Abortion, a right that Indian women have had since 1971, was no longer available as it was not considered an essential service pushing women who needed the service to turn to quacks and unsafe abortions. The supply of contraceptives was greatly reduced because manufacturing was shut down, as was international trade, and so raw materials, ingredients, etc. could not be secured. For example, India and China are tied at the hip in the production of contraceptives. India is one of the largest manufacturers of contraceptives in the world, and raw materials for these are purchased from China. So you can well imagine what happened to this. Match this circumstance with increased sexual activity inside households because of the lockdown, and you have a recipe for unwanted pregnancies, sexually transmitted diseases, and so on. Our health workers, 75% of them women, were particularly vulnerable. They were at risk, they were underpaid, they did not receive their salaries, they had to work long hours, they caught the illness, they died. In India, we have a system of different levels of women in care work. Close to the bottom are women called ASHA workers, whose job it is to go from village to village, to do surveys, to deliver food, rations, sanitary pads, etc. sometimes working a 16-hour day. During the COVID crisis, it was all of these women who, without protective equipment, had to do this work, which obviously put their lives at risk. Many poor homes do not have toilets inside and women especially use the fields, not only as toilets, but as public spaces to get rid of sanitary waste. This now became impossible and several things like this. I don't need to go on about this, but I do want to go back to something I said earlier, the background of the anti-CAA, the Citizen Amendment Act protests. These and the violence that my speakers have referred to earlier in parts of Delhi at the time, led the police to make arrests, one-sided arrests, mostly of the Muslim community. Among these arrests also were young women students, not necessarily Muslim, charged with all kinds of crimes, such as attempted murder, and on the basis of a terrible law that denies them their civil liberties and human rights. Two of these women who belong to a university group, Anuradha has referred to them, that for years had been fighting for the rights of women students are still in jail and have been consistently denied bail. One young woman, Sofura Zargar, was pregnant when she was arrested. She finally won bail and her, uh, on the fourth attempt, I think, and her lawyer won the bail on the argument of the rights of the unborn fetus. Even though it is understandable why this happened, because there was no other way to get bail for her, and the lawyer needed to get her out. The danger here is that this argument can easily fall into the hands of the anti-abortionists in the future. So women workers in particular were also very badly impacted. Among them, further vulnerabilities such as caste, religion, disability, marital status exacerbated the situation. A partner group of ours worked on a survey in 11 districts of Assam looking at what happened to women's work during the lockdown. They collected information from a small number of women, 246, but nonetheless it gives us an idea of what is happening to their lives. Of the women they spoke to, 86% of them lost paid work as a result of the lockdown, 4.9% worked partially, and only 9% were able to continue working. 
Nearly 67% of them had not been paid. Only 20% had received full payment. And how many will go back to work is anyone's guess. And how many will have work to go back to is even more uncertain. Most of these women are poor. Many are migrant labor. In the last couple of decades, because of the uncertainties created by climate change, seasons, for example, are no longer as predictable as they used to be. No one knows when it will be winter or summer, really, and temperatures have also changed. So the seasonal jobs and things like construction, etc., are also extremely fragile. The pandemic and lockdown is yet another blow and one which women will have to face with the double brunt of a loss of livelihoods. Travel is now impossible, more so for those who have disabilities. So how do they access any money that may be due to them? For the visually impaired, for example, touch is so important to make their way around in their lives that this is now impossible. So that is another thing to deal with. These are just some of the issues. I basically wanted to flag a few of them to draw your attention to the situation of women. Let me now turn to a slightly broader subject that is at the heart of this conference, and that is of the community. So it became clear during the lockdown that neither the state nor the corporate world and previous speakers have talked, both upholders of capitalism, were in the least bit concerned about the working class and the poor, even less so about women. As you've heard, millions of workers were rendered jobless, they had to walk, etc. I won't go into that. It was at this time that one of the communities that is most reviled by the state and even by ordinary people came to the fore to help. And this was the NGOs and small political groups. They worked to provide relief, cash, clothes, and all of this while the state sat on millions of tons of food grains that they could easily have distributed. NGOs and activist groups also realized another important thing that given that everyone was trying to hide information or put out false information, an important need was to document accurate information, to collect as much information as they could, to make films, to do surveys, to put out materials, so that in the future there would be some kind of record of what people have gone through. Because if we rely on state and police records, we will get a completely false picture. They worked on this often at great risk to themselves. As a result of this, we have a decent amount of information on COVID-19 and the lockdown and reactions to it among the poor. And women activist communities and women <clears throat> also helped each other. Everywhere across India, you come up with stories of more and more women providing help. So in concluding, I want to tell you two of these stories because these are the kinds of things that give us hope and courage. One, the first story is about a letter that women's groups from India wrote. And I started, when I started, I talked about a letter. That was a letter to the chief minister of Delhi. This was a different letter. This was written to the heads of various departments at the universities of Harvard and Yale in the United States, because a number of scholars based in those universities had produced a study on India and on Indian women sex workers whose profession is very, very badly impacted by COVID and the lockdown. And that study recommended that red light areas in India be closed down because these were the vectors of the disease and it was prostitutes who could not practice social distancing who were spreading the disease. Nothing could be further from the truth. The study was ill-informed, not peer-reviewed, there are very few red light areas in Delhi. Sex work does not take place in brothels anymore other than in three or four places. And clearly this study was based on some kind of moral uh, white man's burden uh, to come into India and recommend. But the, our government, slave to certain parts of the world, took it seriously and the police started clamping down on whatever uh, brothels there were. So women got together and wrote a detailed letter rebutting every aspect of the study and demanding to know what kind of ethics committees it had gone through and so on. And they have just heard back from the University of Harvard and Yale to say they're going to look into it. So this is a small victory. I don't know if anything will happen, but the fact is that women are putting up a fight. The second story is a little story that comes from uh, the Northeastern state of Manipur. And it's the story of a young woman, a wife whose husband uh, was, is a manual laborer and who was out of work because of the pandemic and the lockdown. 
And in previous days, they used to succeed in getting food, which he would bring on his way back home from work in the evening. And she would cook a meal for the family and for her children. And then this completely dried up. And the landlady started demanding rent and asked them to leave. And then the young woman started to dream of jackfruit, making jackfruit curry. And she describes in her story, in her own words, how she was think, dreaming of how she would cut the jackfruit, how she would fry it, how she would put onions, etc., etc. Jackfruit is the replacement for meat for people who eat vegetables or who cannot afford to buy meat in this country. Wherever it grows, it is called the meat of the tree. And then suddenly there was a knock on the door and her landlady, a Muslim woman called Aisha, came in and she was holding a jackfruit from her garden in her hand. And she said, I know you're worried, but at times like this, we have to have each other's backs. If we don't support each other, who will? Because the state has collapsed. The corporate world has collapsed. We only have each other. And here is a jackfruit from my garden. You cook it for your meal today. And then she offered her some work and said, don't worry about the rent. I'll give you another few months. I know you don't have money and let's see what happens. So she helped her out and the two women together were able to turn adversity into something really beautiful and inspiring. And I want to point to this because I want to say that end by saying that everywhere across India against this really dismal large picture of state failure and of capitalist profiteering are small stories of human beings and particularly of women who are finding their way out of this and who are building solidarities with each other. Thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> yes. So now, uh, well, we have scheduled this session for one and a half hours, but then of course, um, if there are a lot of questions and a lot of um, discussions, we can extend it to up to uh, two hours. So now I would like to invite um, uh, some of our uh, friends here to ask questions. So I can see that uh, Gao Ming, uh, she, uh, who teaches in Shanghai, she has a question. So maybe Gao Ming you can just um, raise the question yourself. Many thanks to uh, the four speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, I have known uh, more about India, the, the status of India. I have one question. As many of you have mentioned that the informal sector has decreased in the, in the COVID period, especially in the lockdown period, then I'm curious about how you will see how how do you see the informal sector in India? Uh, do you mean that informal sector will do good to the economic status of the poor people? Or do you think that the informal sector need to, how to say, grade uh, to, to up to the to more, more formal sector? Uh, this is my question. Thank you. Maybe we can hear a few more questions. And actually, the panelists, uh, you can also uh, ask each other questions or make comments. So, uh, I, uh, actually, I've um, invited some uh, of our friends to be panelists, so you can see more names on the uh, on the screen. But then, for those of you who are uh, in the in, among the attendees, please also uh, raise your raise your hand. Uh, you can you have a raise hand. Um, a function there so you can raise hand and we can let you in and then you could ask the questions so any questions uh, actually uh, it doesn't mean that the informal sector has decreased informal sector uh, reality has got exposed we need more security for uh, unorganized labor and we had a whole commission in 2006 uh, it's called the Gupta <laughs> Committee. And those recommendations uh, have not been implemented. There is a law for social welfare. But even that is not implemented. So it's not that uh, informal sector labor is decreased. The plight of the uh, migrant labor and many others, poor people uh, who um, suffered even more, they suffer even in the ordinary uh, uh, situation, but now they suffered even more. Uh, and therefore, uh, and you know that in the neoliberal economy, I think Arindam should speak more about it. Uh, in the neoliberal economy, uh, the whole emphasis is on informalization. And 
the new labor laws also shrink the labor rights and they push some of the security of the uh, regular labor or organized labor into unorganized uncertain insecure labor uh, therefore what we are demanding is security higher wages better working conditions uh, right to life with dignity right to living wage uh, and several such uh, conditions for labor in the informal sector i think arindam should add and uh, and others yes yeah should i just uh, uh, i mean just to briefly reflect on the point i mean to what uh, just to add to what professor mohanty has said i mean in india more than 90% of the workers are located in this informal sector so when i am saying that the informal economy parts of it is getting wiped out it does not mean that these people who are located who are earning their livelihoods from these sectors are automatically getting alternative livelihoods what is probably going to happen because given that the labor productivity in the formal sector is very high the absolute number of requirement the absolute requirement of labor in a formal economy even if it replaces the informal economy that's going to be much less so the informal economy is actually generates livelihoods in india i mean of course agriculture itself is the biggest informal economy within this large informal sector that we are talking about so what is going to happen is that more and more people are going to slip into underemployment there would be a greater dependence on uh, land and natural resources back in the villages and uh, that's going to lead to different kinds of conflicts overall such kind of uh, brutal assault while it might uh, i mean a brutal assault on the informal economy while it may raise profits for sections of big capital is not going to address the question of livelihoods uh, uh, living standards and employment of the masses so that is where the, i think the contradiction lies so uh, anu uh, would you have anything to add i think i agree um, with my co panelists uh, the uh, informal sector uh, in india is extremely large and uh, they have no social net really uh, and uh, women and minorities and they, this coincides with our caste and class structure really Uh, if you see the informal um, economy uh, you would find disproportionate number of our uh, you know our minority communities like the muslims etc are part of the informal economy and i, I said in my paper that uh, for example in urban areas uh, 50% or more of the muslims are in the informal economy with no social net and no access uh to social services uh really and women also are really large parts of this informal uh, economy and there's no hope for them of joining the formal economy in fact the formal workers in the formal economy their rights are being eroded um you know so the formal economy is almost becoming informalized because union rights and there was a one day uh kind of strike by all unions and there was another strike by the bank employees unions because of this informalization of the formal uh so these are interpenetrating really and uh, india lives by the informal economy and when the uh, they were called migrant workers but they were actually informal working class who moved back to their villages because of the fear of the this lock out um and crack out crack down really rather than just a lockdown uh when they went back it was then that the first time that the from the middle class to all sections above and the upper caste etc felt their need that these should be actually essential workers because they were no longer there to do the plumbing or or the or the sweeping or cleaning of roads etc that's the first time that they felt the gap and they said these should be essential workers but they never got any essential rights so they're essential workers with non essential rights so that really is a tragedy of uh, of the indian of the indian economy in in my view thanks 
Well, thank you. So, um, actually, we are supposed to end now, but then I think we, we are still receiving a lot of questions. But then, because Uvashi will have to leave, Uvashi, actually, thank you so much uh, for coming to this session. Maybe you could say some, uh, any remarks before you go. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think we should use the time. There's lots of questions. So, um, I have no ending remarks except to say thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of this. And I will stay till I can and I'll quietly just exit. Okay, so now we have uh, more questions. So, I think uh, Vandana would uh, have a question. Firstly, I want to thank the panelists for a really illuminating session. Um, and I have a very quick comment. I've posted a link uh, to a very important first Indian climate assessment report that was released just weeks ago, which is pretty grim. And it's very important to note that this is happening in the background while all the immediate uh, trage tragedies and disasters are taking place. Uh, but my question, if there's time for it, I'll just try to say it briefly. It seems to me that all the panelists here are here, and perhaps the, is part of the reason for this conference I'm attending for the first time, that all of you see a different world. And the, one of the things the pandemic has also exposed is the possibility of that different world, or different worlds, rather. Uh, because when we see the fault lines exposed, we see the cracks in the grand structure of neoliberal capitalism and, um, and the very anthropocentric way of living that modernity has, uh, has pushed for a long time. And so uh, I guess my question is both general and specific, that uh, what, despite all the darkness, uh, you know, I think pretty much all of you mentioned some glimmers of hope. Um, but I want to I want to try to see whether there is uh, what kind of worlds do you envisage that can arise from the ruins of this one? For example, uh, can we see a revival or and I don't mean revival in the sense of going back, but a revival in the sense of something new and inclusive to see a village economy thrive? And in the words of an Adivasi writer whose name I am uh, blanking out on right now, uh, she said, one of the things we know from our culture is that all your basic needs have to be met locally. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether you see any potential for villages to reinvent themselves in particular. Thank you. So, who, who would like to take this on, take this question? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree that, uh, I mean, any kind of a, a crisis uh, should lead to a certain journey uh, and the emergence of a new, which is much better than what was existing earlier. I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, just some initial thoughts uh, to reflect on the migrant crisis uh, that we have seen. I mean, the lives of the migrants in the cities were always precarious, uh, which is why, uh, I mean, it did not even take uh, more than two days for the migrants to be on the roads. They immediately, as soon as the lockdown was announced, uh, people's uh, incomes uh, were, were blocked. Uh, they knew that they would not be able to pay the rents uh, in the urban cities and all of that, and they immediately started walking back. So whatever we had as a buoyant economic growth model itself was already faulty to begin with. That much is very much clear, and I completely agree with you on that. Uh, in that context, then, we can think of now that, I mean, people have realized the precarity uh, in a very hard way, uh, of, of, of this kind of an economic model of migrating to cities, earning, sending remittances back. There needs to be a resurgence of the rural economy. And of course, it cannot just simply happen, uh, I mean, on, on private individual initiative, but there needs to be some kind of rural uh, industrialization. And again, industrialization becomes a scary word, but I'm talking about industrialization in terms of small scale industrialization. Uh, processing industries, largely uh, uh, kind of organized on the, in the lines of cooperatives, not as private capitalist, big capitalist led industries, uh, which penetrate into rural areas only with the intention of extracting surplus away from the rural areas into the urban areas. But some, some kind of economic activities, which is going to push back organized capital from the different value chains, and it's going to retain more of that value in the rural areas, it is going to uh, kind of uh, uh, plow back more of the surplus that is produced, surplus not in a private capitalist sense, but in a cooperative sense. It can plow back more of that and make rural areas thriving. But 
more importantly and more immediately i think in the context of the pandemic what the indian government definitely needs to do uh, something that is barely i mean that has been kind of starkly pointed out to us is wide spread and large scale public investments in rural health uh, public health and public education in rural india it's practically missing and this is the opportunity to do that which itself would create jobs it would bring in skilled people it would retain some doctors and educators in the villages and can transform the villages in a cultural sense also. so i think i mean these are ideas very initial ideas but something that we need to push for more and more in the times of this crisis well thank you so uh, uvashi you are still here maybe Would you like to say something? Yeah, can I come in on Vandana's question, please? You know, I don't know. All of this may sound very wishy-washy, but I want to refer to this thing, which is not the large economic pattern, but people's feelings. And I think uh, from what we are hearing now, from the people that we know in our personal sphere who have had to migrate and who have gone back home. Uh, is the expression of a sense of deep hurt and a sense of feeling. the inequality and feeling the insult in um not only economic ways but also um also you know for example a domestic worker working in a home for 3 uh, years 4 years builds up a relationship and then comes a time like this and the homemaker says uh, you get out because you're dirty and i don't want you to come and you can spread the disease and i will not pay you salary either so i think the hurt of that is is as deep as being paid a bad salary or as not being paid a salary and i think there is sense of collective hurt and also the sense of what does the damn city have to offer us i mean many people i've spoken to will say we are here out in the open okay we at least have something to eat but cities which are hostile to us where people don't even like us where they see us as scum why should we go back there I don't know if there is a possibility of something coming out of that uh, emotion if it's widespread enough and I know that uh, when we are talking hard economics emotions are not things we should be speaking about but that's really what I like to talk about so that's the reason I wanted to mention it Well, thank you. Um, well, Bidu uh, would like to speak. Well, I hope we will be ending this session in uh, within 10 minutes. So um, maybe I will introduce uh, I will um, invite uh, Bidut. Actually, uh, Pallavi also has something to say, and then we also have one question from uh, Dionysus. Uh, uh, but then, uh, since uh, actually we are going to have the next session uh, in uh, well fifty minutes, so uh, some of the questions, if we cannot finish with them, then we can continue in the next session. But then, Bidut, please. And I can inform the people. that we are engaged in a uh, project in polisa migration and i can speak a little bit on that if you allow me for 2 minutes first of all it has impacted the culture you know the cholera has certain goddesses now covid also has another goddess so it has impacted the culture now odisha economy you know you talked about arun or in them talked about mg narega work but a brewery cannot be absorbed there because you know it means the digging of the uh, you know the mart and all that and skill laborers are not willing to do as vandana put it we must reinvent the labor market reinvent mg narega work and we must address to this question to the panchayat representative at the grassroots level because so far the labor was building the city now they have to build their own economy and the urban needs to be geared with the rural needs not vice versa thank you uh, thank you so um I think uh, maybe we will. Uh, well, since we are going to hear from Pallavi and Sujit uh, in forty-five minutes, so maybe uh, you can come in uh, later in your session. And I would invite you all to come back uh, at um, well, it's 
two o'clock Hong, uh, Hong Kong and Beijing time, and um, it two two o'clock. Yes, Hong Kong Beijing time, and um, that would be eleven thirty a.m. Uh, Indian time. So we have one question from uh, Dionysus. Uh, maybe could you uh, could you say your question? My question will be uh, maybe to all the panelists uh, because I think the phenomena in India, which is uh, I can say like a mobility crisis, because people died well well they're moving really far away in a barefoot. Uh, from the city to the rural area and uh, but uh, this mostly uh, people uh, who are uh, informal workers or we can say like migrant workers but on the other side uh, there are phenomena in US which is uh, people mostly uh, rich people dominated the movement to the rural from the city while pandemic so any uh, any panelists here can have some opinion against uh, with this uh, really contrast situation thank you Yes. So since we are running out of time, could we have the um, the speakers? Maybe you can just take one or two minutes to answer these questions or say any final remarks. Yeah, because uh, my iPad is running out of battery. I'll quickly uh, address both uh, uh, the issues. Um, as far as uh, the revival of uh, the village, um, I wouldn't just say economy, but uh, society etc is concerned this is a major slogan but it is a slogan of the government of going back from uh, the global to the global as they use in, in the in neoliberal language uh, and in fact uh, chambers of uh, industry are discussing this going to the local but uh, my view is that there has been really uh, you know this whole concept that uh, the mahatma gandhi had of self sustained uh, village has not taken off from that point itself because uh, it they still rest on uh, the local exploitative money lenders on local uh, patriarchal caste systems uh, i had done a small survey with action aid and i found things like Dalit villages and Muslim bastis. So the segregation and discrimination is huge. And uh, this will be a new layer uh, of exploitation on these. It won't be a change, but there will be a new layer superimposed on the existing uh, oppressions and discriminations and hierarchies within the villages. Uh, of course, uh, there have been some changes like, you know, 33% women in panchayats and the local self bodies. But again, I was on a, a kind of a tribunal on that. And a lot of husbands said, and they said they were the spouses of the panchayat women in, in the local bodies. And they were taking decisions. So there are changes, but there are also regressions. And it's really uh, the height of individualism has seeped down into the villages where everyone is just for themselves. Uh, the state has withdrawn, uh, even the corporates have withdrawn, except when they want to get land or they want to remove them and move them into clusters and use those particular areas for either mining or new industries. And so this so-called army of surplus labor from the villages uh, keeps increasing uh, and there is no um, uh, you know nothing really very uh, radical happening in the villages yes the NGO and civil society has also moved into uh, villages there have been very dramatic um, uh, movements where villagers have come together and resisted against whether it was nuclear power plants or save the trees and those kind of uh, movements uh, but they remain uh, far and in between and they're very easy to really clamp down on thank you thank you so uh manu would you like to say something uh, i i'll unmute you first okay okay so please uh, we will have uh, the um, analekha experience the gandhian uh, experiment a uh, full session later on and the Kerala experience they actually demonstrate also the possibilities I, I know what uh, Anu has in mind uh, 
uh, and that was Ambedkar's skepticism about Panchayat Raj and village, uh, uh, you know, um, self-reliant village, uh, which has to be kept in mind. And that critique has to be always made of how uh, uh, traditional village structures perpetuated caste domination and class domination. Yet, the Kerala experience has shown, and globally, the land rights movement uh, in Brazil has shown, and many other instances in India and the world have shown, that the village uh, or the rural economy has to be reconstructed, just as the urban economy has to be reconstructed. The terms of trade between rural and urban have to become even. Right now, the city is exploiting the village. And within the village, the upper caste, upper class, patriarchal structures are exploiting the, uh, the majority of the population. That is why how different structures of politics, economy, culture, and society have to be imagined and implemented. That is very important. Right now in India, even with 50%, now 33 has become 50, 50% 50 women reservation, the panchayat is only a delivery channel of centrally planned World Bank sponsored ideas and schemes to reach the service delivery targets at the grassroots level. Panchayat has to be reconceptualized as an instrument of self-governance by the majority of the people to realize their basic democratic rights. Panchayat has to be an institution of caste transformation, ending discrimination of land reforms of sustainable development. They are the best guarantee for protecting local environment, local natural resources. And so therefore, and that uh, Adivasi uh, uh, woman uh, writer, uh, I mean, I know several of them who have that same view. Uh, in other words, they are the protectors. The local people are the protectors of the local environment. Therefore, uh, I think, you know, the migrant labor return has occasioned a rethink that uh, a local economy in the rural area has to create enough em employment opportunities so that the rural people then can have a negotiating power to go to the city on even and equitable terms in order that there is a mobility of livelihood, mobility of labor. Therefore, we need a complete reimagination of local political economy. Thank you. Thank you, Manu, so much. Uh, I think on this note, we will end this session. Please go to the uh, Global University website because on the reader, we have uploaded a lot of writings by the uh, panelists. And, uh